Hello and welcome, everybody, to episode 26 of Last Week in Quantum. I'm your host, Bill Roth. This is a show where we discuss this week's news in the world of quantum computing and its impacts on the world of cybersecurity, AI, and more. And with us to discuss it this week is our usual all-star panel. First up, Mr. Brandon Brandon Dennis, Director of Operations at QSecure. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you, Bill. And the ever-knowledgeable Meg Gleason, Head of UX and Product Adoption at QSecure. Welcome, Meg. Great to be here, Bill. So, folks, last week in Quantum, a couple of really interesting articles. Uh, NVIDIA joins the ongoing race to quantum computing cloud services. Big surprise there. Uh, why error correction is quantum computing's defining challenge? Can't wait to hear more about that. And as always, you know I loves me some good legislation. We've got some new legislation to accelerate DOD's quantum efforts to the next level. Let's get started by talking to our experts. So first up, Bloomberg had a piece on nvidia they just had their big show here in california the gt or in san jose the big gtc conference we thank them for uh supporting our downtown but uh, nvidia uh just sort of just joined the quantum computing cloud services race what did they end up doing brandon yeah nvidia launched a cloud service for researchers to test out their quantum computing software uh the nvidia Quantum Cloud will first comprise a data center stacked with AI chips and systems that together simulate a quantum computer. Pretty interesting article here, Meg. I know you had a chance to look it over. Uh, considering the global investment in quantum computing, how significant do you believe that NVIDIA's entry into the space with the Quantum Cloud service will be for overall growth of quantum computing technology? Yeah, thanks, Brandon. I think this is a, a pretty exciting development, um, seeing NVIDIA expand beyond their traditional graphics chip business into the quantum cloud space and, and starting to touch areas like data centers and the use of AI. Um, I think that this is just another sort of data point in the momentum that is building uh, within the, the race to quantum as a whole. Um, you know, NVIDIA jumping into this market, it's it's a little bit saturated at this point. Uh, there's definitely going to be heating up competition with the, uh, the tech giants. I'm excited to see how NVIDIA plays with folks like IBM and Google and Microsoft, who are also heavily investing. Um, it can be really interesting to see what comes out of this. I think the more folks, especially with a giant like NVIDIA, uh, the more these types of folks get involved in the space, uh, the more resources that are going to become available, more computational resources, there'll be a, a build for greater traction. Um, I think some really interesting research in particular is going to come out of uh, what NVIDIA is offering here. Um, and I think all of this will ultimately accelerate uh, development towards, uh, you know, using quantum computing to solve real world problems. So I think the more speed we can get behind this with big players like NVIDIA, the better. And we'll also maybe see some interesting partnerships start to develop as these big players play with each other. You know, rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, thanks, Meg. Uh, I tell you what, what I think's going on here, uh, this week I went to a presentation by NVIDIA, basically on ChatGPT. And what's it's becoming clear that NVIDIA specifically is really becoming sort of like Sun was with Java and that they're trying to provide a platform and they're getting all of these other people to use their technology to do both the AI stuff as well as the quantum stuff. So this could be much like you now can have many different platforms like Amazon, uh, the various cloud pro providers have AI services. I think you'll see quantum services across the board as well. And as you get multiple services, you'll start to see pricing tend um, south. Quick reminder, folks, you can find all the links uh, today uh, for the articles mentioned in our show notes. And if you want weekly quantum updates, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and podcast on, and, and our podcasts are also on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. Stay up to date on the top news in quantum with last week in quantum. Okay, nerd alert. Physics World had an article about why error correction is quantum computing's defining challenge. Brandon, tell me more. Yeah, I pulled the summary here. Quantum computers are advancing, yet the error-prone nature of qubits hinders widespread use. 
to unleash their full potential, new tools managing unstable qubits and correcting errors rapidly are crucial. So Meg, can you explain the primary challenges that scientists and engineers face when trying to stabilize qubits in quantum computers? Yeah, happy, happy to give it a go, Brandon, thanks. So just to kind of do a little bit of level setting, um, what is a qubit? It is essentially the, the fundamental unit of quantum mechanics. Um, it is a, a physical thing, but on a very different scale on the, the quantum scale, which can kind of tend for folks to check out a little bit. Um, but they're pretty cool. Uh, you can think of them as, you know, compared to our current bits, which are, you know, ones or zeros. Um, these are a little bit like a coin that you can spin. So it's got those two sides, but it can be both a, a one and a zero at the same time. Um, so they're pretty powerful and necessary for quantum computers to work, harnessing that power, uh, because you can basically use all those multiple states that are happening at once uh, to solve problems in a different way than current classical computers can solve them. Um, so just a little bit of background on, on what a qubit is. Um, and, you know, given that it's at that crazy scale that's really hard to conceptualize uh, and that it can be so many different things at once. I uh, can imagine that it is a little bit challenging to manage these things, keep them stable and functional. So a lot of folks, you know, as the article points out, uh, are, are trying to grapple with making these things stable and therefore useful so we can leverage them. So there are a couple of different challenges at play here. Uh, you know, there's something called quantum coherence, which is basically that ability to, to maintain essentially like the movement and so that these qubits can be used in different states. Uh, just like a spinning top, it will eventually fall over. Um, so that is when it's called decoherence. And so that's one of the primary challenges uh, folks are trying to grapple with right now. Because as soon as these qubits interact with pretty much anything else, they get spun over like a top um, and therefore no longer useful. And then, uh, you know, how do we grapple with that, that challenge of these things moving all over sort of frenetically uh, and trying to keep them, keep them contained and therefore useful? Uh, error correction, as Brandon pointed out. Um, they're super sensitive. The tiniest disturbances throw them off their game. Um, and so there are these algorithms being developed that basically like kind of help clean them up and stay in their lanes so that they can stay productive and fix problems um, without causing more problems. And on top of it all, um, if that wasn't enough to wrangle, these things have to work in uh, very specific physical conditions. They need extremely controlled environments and very cold temperatures. Uh, any tiniest bit of heat or vibration from the environment, again, throws them out of loop. So it's really an interesting problem to see people solving. Uh, very sensitive, powerful little things that just take a little bit of disturbance um, and the, the error correction. You know, all the, those algorithms are trying to just wrangle that back in so these things can be powerful for us. That, so first of all, I think you get credit for two super powerful metaphors. Uh, I hope you created it because the spinning coin actually finally, the literally to, to extend the metaphor, the penny just dropped for me. And I think that's a really uh, useful way to do it. So I'm going to give you total credit for it, even if you didn't create it. And also the spinning top. So uh, well done on uh, metaphor production for that last answer. So coming up next. Okay, you know I love some good legislation. Uh, Quantum Insider had stuff, uh, had a piece about some new legislation uh, that's coming up that will accelerate DOD's quantum efforts. This comes on the back of the latest budget and the latest passing of the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, Brandon, tell us a little bit about it. This is from uh, Representative Stefanik of New York. Tell us a little bit more. Yeah, we have representatives uh, set to introduce the Defense Quantum Acceleration Act, and this is aiming to integrate quantum information science technology with the Department of Defense. This legislation aims with appointing a principal quantum advisor to streamline quantum research efforts. Uh, Meg, how do you how might the Defense Quantum Acceleration Act impact the future of national security and defense strategies? 
Great question, Brandon. It's uh, it's definitely exciting to see the the government taking motion in the quantum space, particularly on the DoD side, um, and in pushing towards additional uh, technology development and research in the area of quantum. Um, of course, being on the QSecure side, I have to put the the plug in for the acceleration towards uh, protection against quantum. Uh, computing attacks against encryption. I think that there's a lot of potential for this act to accelerate research in in developing quantum resistant encryption techniques and ultimately apply those to securing communications. Um, when we consider, you know, communications across uh, different control systems for the military against uh, or across, you know, critical infrastructure for our nation. Um, this data is is essential for necess is essential and necessary for for keeping life going and keeping our folks safe across the globe. And so, I think there's real potential for additional, uh, you know, advancements within the the quantum communication space, making sure that those in, uh, communication channels are secured, uh, that they are not vulnerable to, to attacks for storing out crypt later or people coming in on the wire and grabbing critical information, especially mission critical information uh, on its way to, to its destination and then decrypting it. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for the act to affect uh, communication development on the quantum side to keep those safe. Uh, and I also think it's just a great step uh, in positioning the U.S. a little bit more strategically globally. You know, it's no secret that the race towards quantum technologies is a global race with some pretty big implications for who gets there first on a couple of different levels. And I think that by putting this act forward, it strengthens our position and competitive advantage in the global landscape. Um, just, you know, bolstering research, education, and, and refining our infrastructure and protecting it, I think is a great move um, for, for the U.S. and also for our allies. Great. Thanks very much, Meg. Folks, if you're looking for that legislation, it, as, as of Wednesday, uh, we are, uh, the, the legislation is not up. But if you go to congress.gov, search for uh, Defense Quantum Acceleration Act. That's the place to find it. Great website where you can sign up for uh, alerts on all forms of legislation. That's all for today's show. I'm your host, Bill Roth, and with us this week has been an all-star cast, uh, which includes Brandon Dennis, Director of Operations, and Meg Gleason, Head of UX and Product Adoption at QSecure. Thank you to you both. Always a hoot, guys. Thanks so much. All right, that's it for this week on Last Week in Quantum. <laughs>